Good afternoon. Very nice to see you all here at the British Library this afternoon and welcome to everybody watching uh, online at libraries up and down the country or wherever you may be around the world. It's great to have you all together for this uh, very special session. Uh, my name is John. I look after the events programme here at the British Library and I was thrilled when I was told we were going to be hosting a fantasy exhibition, uh, Realms of the Imagination, which opened last October and runs till February. And I'm sure many of you have seen it, but if not, it, it's, uh, it's a tremendous whistle stop the ride through uh, costumes, through manuscripts, through books, through artworks, games, and much, much more, uh, telling the story of what we know as fantasy, and I, I strongly recommend it. We're very proud of it. Uh, we've got a fantastic events programme that runs alongside it. We've had over from Neil Gaiman to Susan Cooper. But when we were planning that programme, one of the first names that obviously sprung to mind was of the current generation, the most exciting new names. Uh, Rebecca F. Kwong was one of the first people we reached out to, and we were absolutely delighted that she accepted our invitation to come over to London for this event. Um, so later on, uh, there'll be a chance for you to put your questions to the speakers, and uh, there'll be books uh, signing outside. Uh, those of you who want to buy a book and you're online, there's that little tab at the top of the page where you can pick one up if you'd like. As I say, you'll be able to answer questions, and also the online audience can fill in questions on the bottom of the uh, video window and put the questions to our speakers. So uh, many of you know exactly who Rebecca F. Kwong is. Uh, she's this uh, New York Times, Sunday Times best-selling author of the Poppy War trailer, Jilly Trilogy, sorry, it's getting on, um, it, the uh, uh, hugely successful Babel and Arcane History, uh, and most recently this year, Yellow Face, which was a, a sensational publishing moment. Um, she is also a, a student currently, a PhD student uh, in East Asian languages and literature at Yale University. So uh, she will be in conversation with a fantastic British uh, um, uh, fantasy author Sarah L. Arifi, um, who also many of you will know her books are also outside of her for the signing afterwards. They include uh, The Final Strife and Battle Drum, part of a trilogy which uh, is based on uh, many things, but including African and um, Arabian myth. So that's all from me. I'd like you to very much welcome to the stage Sarah L. Arifi and Rebecca F. Kwong. <laughs> Amazing. So we didn't trip. That was like the hardest thing. We didn't no, we all we were talking about backstage was how were we going to not trip. I'm so, I was stressed. I was stressed. Did anyone see me hesitate? I was like, <laughs> Anyway, hi everyone. I'm here with Rebecca Kwan. Oh my God. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I want to start with a really contentious question. <laughs> Which novel that you've written is your favourite? <laughs> That's really hard to say because I don't know how you feel about your novels, but as soon as I finish one, I'm like, okay, that's out there. I don't yeah. know them anymore. Yeah, I don't um, know them. I don't. It's Who like is she? You're, I, like, you think you've graduated. Yeah. I'm not paying for your internet bill anymore. Um, <laughs> but I think, well, so like publishing is really weird because by the time a novel goes out into the world, your relationship with it has ended a long time ago. Mm. We usually finish the final, like the real final draft, maybe a year and a half, two yeah. years before the novel hits shelves, and maybe there are copy edits in between, but doing those isn't the same as that sense of finality turning in the last major revision. So then by the time the novel's out and then you're doing interviews about it and going on tour to promote it, it feels a bit like taking credit for, it feels like cheating, like taking credit yeah. for an exam that you didn't take or that a different person took. And yeah. I also have this whole theory about how we become different people in the process of writing novels. And we often have to become the person that the novel requires or the novel becomes what we need at that time. And I like subscribe to Derek Parfit's theory of like the non-existence of personal identity um, sustaining over time. Meaning, I just don't feel like I am the same person that I was when I was 19. I feel like we have the relationship of cousins, maybe, like an annoying little sister, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I just don't know what it's like to be in that brain space anymore. So I guess each 
past book is this interesting peek into how I was thinking about the world at a different point in time, but I don't relate very hard to any of them because I think we have to keep growing and yeah. keep changing otherwise. We stagnate. What about you? Once, <laughs> once they're out, I'm like, see ya. That's not my book anymore. By the way, you're so smart. <laughs> This is just going to be me flirting with her. Well, did you have a book that was easier to write than all of the others? or? So Feybound came really easily to me. That's my upcoming novel in January. And I think, for me, I was looking for joy. And I was like, yeah, why, why not do a face-sitting scene? <laughs> so, yeah, it was, very much, it was very much like finding joy in a time where I was like quite stressed. And for me, Feybound came so quickly. And we're all so... How wonderful for all involved. <laughs> I think, so I like, I'm equally proud of all of my work, but there are novels that felt like pulling teeth. Like yeah. this last book, I'm supposed to turn in a draft of Catabasis on New Year's <gasps> Eve, and we're getting there, but it has felt much Wait, did harder. you say Christmas Eve? New Year's Eve. Okay. Still, do you take a break? Well, I, like, it's better than talking to my sister, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh! I just like there's always so much family you can take, so it's good to have an excuse. Um, but like, Catabasis has involved so much reading and thinking and stepping away from the manuscript and coming back and figuring out the voice. And on the other hand, novels like Yellow Face just popped into my head, fully formed, and that was also a really easy draft. Like that came together in 60 days. Like the bulk of the story, there were revisions afterwards, but that's the fastest I've written like the initial draft of anything. And I don't think I'll ever draft like that ever again because that was such a crazy, weird, one-time experience. And frankly, I don't really like writing in that space. I don't like thinking about the internet very much. But Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair. Um, I want to talk about Babel a little bit. So <laughs> it's like such a sick burn on the education system that we still currently have. What was it that you kind of, what was like, this, what sparked the idea of it? Like, why did you want to write it? So there's like this positive, sweet answer, and then a snarky answer. Oh, please, snarky. And then the snarky answer is I was at Oxford and in a conversation with someone who was meticulously explaining to me the different types of robes you could wear depending on your status and like how they would throw me out of the dining hall if I didn't wear my robe in there. And people just eat in the, it's like a normal dining hall. <laughs> you can yeah. just go in there and have food. Um, and I thought, wow, like, you really care about this stuff. Like, what is it about this tradition and this pretense and this, um, like, all these rituals that hold so much meaning for you? Like, why does it make you feel so good to participate in them? Um, and then a lot of the critique of class performance, um, and town and gown came out of that. But more than its critique of how awful university is, I think Babel is a celebration of found family and how yeah. the friendships and the weirdos you meet at university make it bearable. Uh, and there's this, the very first scene I ever wrote of Babel um, is also the scene that is least changed. And I wrote it before I knew any of the characters' backgrounds or even their names. Um, I just used filler names that got changed afterwards. But it happened after this one night. I was at, um, well, so we all had really bad depression. So we just like- I laugh, would, sorry, I just laughed. <laughs> We would congregate on the floor of my friend Katie's room every week and make some food that was perfectly passable and just like be depressed together. Um, and we also like started playing Bananagrams, but yeah. then, um, then somebody was cheating because feetsy is not a word. So then we were arguing over the I word feetsy. <laughs> I'm holding this grudge. <laughs> um, and we were arguing about that, and then somebody was like, "It smells like. Do you guys smell bananas?" And I think maybe there was some group hallucination because we were playing bananagrams, but suddenly we became all like deeply convinced that there was this intense stench of bananas, but Katie kept claiming there were no bananas in the room. So we like tore her room apart, like open, like turning her pockets out, looking for the banana peel. And at some point she was like lying on the floor and we were shining our like flashlight, like our phone flashlights in her face, demanding where are the bananas? Um, <laughs> And then I walked home afterwards and it was so quiet and the moon was out and I was, you know, walking along those gorgeous cobblestones and Oxford so beautiful at night and, and I'd been so sad for so many weeks and I just thought, wow, like, I love it here. I love these people. Like, this is, 
this is why I'm going to keep going. And then but I did went you back. Did you find the bananas? And, no. <laughs> She's lying. There's <laughs> um, But so you'll find that exact scene in Babel. They're in Victoire's room and they're playing cards, and then suddenly the cards are on the floor and they're screaming and laughing about fruit that they can't find. And then Robin goes home and he thinks, "Wow, well, I would I would kill for these people." Aww. That's really sweet. I really love that. Um, if you could like spend 24 hours in the world of Babel, let's say the beginning of the novel. <laughs> like Everyone's ready. Good, during good. The, um, during the cholera epidemic. No, no. You can't no. Die. <laughs> You're far away. Maybe inland somewhere. Yeah, you can choose there if you want to choose there. Um, yeah, what would you? Where would you go? What would you do? And who would you do it with, actually? Yeah, all the, all the characters. Sorry, lots of questions. Face sitting in the rad cam. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Why are we on stage? Sorry, yeah. carry on. <laughs> I, well, the thing is, like, I had so many of those experiences yeah, at Oxford, yeah. but I think being in the silverworking lab would yeah, be fun and engraving yeah. words and seeing what happened. Well, not for me, because I really can't speak any language, but... I can imagine for you. Oh, you're managing really. with English, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the world of Wait, but well. where, like, where in your novels would you spend an hour in? Honestly, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Uh, <laughs> probably the, the Fey world in Fey Band, just because, you know, there's... Yeah, but what part of it? Um, there's this, this beach called Conch Shore, which reminds me of some of the beaches that I grew, grew up near. Um, yeah, probably there, just like... Chilling with my own, like. But you, like, can go to beaches. In our world. <laughs> I can't say why, because it's a twist, but it's a special beach. So you've got to read it to find out. <laughs> um, so oh, yeah. I just thought, well, so a, a setting. So Babel has boring answers to where would you go because you can just go to Oxford and London. Yeah, but it's, um, the but I think in the popular trilogy, there's this city. Um, like the pirate city that sometimes I watch Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End <laughs> and I yell at my friends about how it's about third world internationalism and then I also realize it how much of my <laughs> world building <laughs> afterwards has been inspired my by pirates, this remember. film because you know like Shipwreck Cove where all the ships are like kind of tied and nailed together mm. and that's like the city there's a city in the Dragon Republic that is just Chipwreck's Cove from Pirates oh of the God. Caribbean. There is, there's a city in mine current coming up book that is the same. Maybe I was influenced too. Yeah, by the third world internationalism. <laughs> Probably not. Um, so, <laughs> so the world of Babel is amazing because it's like it's so insular in some ways, but also so like transnational. It like brings this aspect of globalization to the Victorian era that I don't think we've really seen that much of. What did your research kind of entail? The really fun thing about um, writing about the Victorian era is that everybody who's doing a pastiche of that era represents it as such an insular, white, like homogenous world. And then everybody doing histories of the era is like, no, like this was a global hub of trade and transportation and people from all over the world were walking those docks and walking the streets opposite to each other. Like you could walk along the Thames and hear people speaking all sorts of languages. Mm. So it was fun like finding historically grounded reasons to make Victorian London a lot more colorful and inclusive and vibrant than the really boring like gray, like standard Victorian England that I think dominates it's our uh, pop culture imagination of that era. Yeah, I think it's just incredible. I don't know, I, I just don't feel like I've seen it done the way that you did it, because um, you are magical. And I just, I just love ling lingering in that world. But I think a lot of authors of colour have written about Victorian England with an emphasis yeah, yeah, on absolutely, like, who but... else was in London that wasn't like, yeah, yeah. darling <laughs> Emma who didn't want to get married and um, yeah. reads books. Poor, poor, poor Emma. Um, let's talk about Robin, Robin Swift's daddy issues. So, um, so Professor Lovell's, he's kind of 
a father figure, but also a colonizer. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic. What was it? Why did you choose to kind of represent their relationship that way? Well, we have to go back to Freud. Yeah. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean to Freud. <laughs> Uh, he just had some really good thoughts about lots of stuff. Some have said that, yeah. And actually, so I have always really enjoyed psychoanalysis, um, if not because it's a really useful framework to understand a lot of colonial dynamics. I think um, it's not so much Freud and Lacan as it is like folks like Fanon who have offered psychoanalytical theories that make very good sense of the uh, relationship between the colonized and the colonized. But even apart from that, I think psychoanalysis is at least useful in just coming up with characters, like in thinking through interiority yeah. and wondering, like, what are the really messed up ways a, a person's mind can warp in? And uh, when I was writing Babel, I was already thinking about Robin as this character that has a split identity, but I think things didn't come together until I read this paper called Mourning and Melancholia by Freud. And it's, I mean, it's really brilliant because it's this, uh, how, how much time do I have to explain? Uh, melancholy. But, I get bored. So <laughs> he's... He's describing a particular form of mourning in which the subject cannot let go of the object that is lost. And in normal processes of grief, you know, like we're, we're sad and we want to cling to the object, but eventually we're able to let it go and move on with our lives. But in the, the melancholic, according to Freud, um, is obsessed with the object that is lost because they hate it and they love it at the same time and in trying to figure out ways in which they can themselves become that object uh, they also have like all these symptoms of self-loathing and recrimination and feeling like they're not worthy and of course I'm talking like and Freud is talking about very specific difficult relationships with fathers so when like things happen to Professor Lovell it's not this uh, easy process of mourning and letting go for Robin. It's this constant questioning of, did I love him? Did I want to become him? Without his authority in my life, who am I? Yeah. And how can I bring him back in a ghostly form by Im like mimicking those traits of his that I both loved and despised? And I think reading that short essay helped me unlock a lot of the really complicated stuff that's going on in the back of Robin's mind for the second half of the book because... He is such a hard character to get your uh, to wrap your head around. And in initial drafts, my editors said that like Robin just didn't make sense to them. And my initial reaction was, "That's because you're racist." And, uh, <laughs> like if you understood his struggle, of course he would make sense to you. But actually, he he does read as really contradictory and frustrating and waffling and wishy-washy. And he thinks one thing one day and then believes something else the next day. And uh, the the challenge with that book was figuring out a way to track that psychological journey very clearly. So yeah. hence Freud and hence daddy issues. Yeah and hence the melancholic. Well, it works. Like, I just, I'm always astounded about the amount of work behind the scenes in building up a character, especially with you. I just think, yeah, you're phenomenal. Um, so <laughs> this novel has three titles. Uh, why? <laughs> well, I'm really bad at coming up with titles. Well, you've come up with three. <laughs> well, so here's how. I didn't come up with, um, so I haven't come up with most of my titles. I'll start there. The Poppy War, my agent came up with that. When I submitted it to her, it was Spears Vengeance. And she was like, sounds cool. I don't know what Spear is, so that's not going to work. Um, then with The Burning God, I also, we went through like 10 really bad titles for it. Um, one of which was The Investiture of the Gods. And I really like this because it's the translation of the Function Yan Yi, which is one of the Chinese mythological epics that the popular trilogy is inspired by. So I was like, it's got to be in the, the Investiture of the Gods. And then my editors said, well, we don't know what the word Investiture means. Do you know what it means? And I said, <laughs> I, it sounds great. Um, I'm saying so, not being just thinking. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so my agent came up with the brain god, 
And then for yellow face, when I sent it to her, it was called In Your Own Words because it's a play on like plagiarism policies. Yeah, you yeah. have to phrase these arguments in your own words, but that's a terrible reason to name a novel, <laughs> something like that. And you also have to think about search engines when you're coming up with titles and in your own words are four of the most common words in the English yeah. language. Yeah. Um, so that didn't work. Uh, so with Babel, the initial title was Class 45, and that was the name of my Scrivener document the whole time I was working on it. Then I sent it in, and they said, okay, interesting title. What's Class 45? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the number 45 has no relevance in the story, like, in any way. And I think in my head, um, I'd named it Class 45 because the year 45 is significant for World War II, but... The novel is set in the 1830s, so um, it, it just like it had an interesting vibe. Um, Soul vibes, no. Substance. So, so they were like, it's, it's we've got to do something different. Like, it can't be class 45. Go back to the drawing board. So I said, the Hermes Society, and then they said, yeah, maybe. Like that, that could be a fun title. Then my fiance, dear Benny, was like, what about Babel? And I said, what about Babel? Wait, he came up with it. Yeah, um, and and my. Editorial team said, well, you'd have to compete with the Bible um, in Google searches. And I said, I think we can beat the Bible. <laughs> I think so. Um, but, but that's the reason why it has all that metadata. So then they're like, can you add like Babel, a novel, or Babel, blah, 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 just to distinguish it from Babel, Tower of, in the Old <laughs> Testament. So I said, OK, here's a paragraph long title, um, because the Victorians were doing that. And they said, you're not Charles Dickens, and you can't do that. Can you give us something shorter? Um, so we came up with three titles that are printed in various places because nobody could compromise. But now if you Google Babel, you do get me. Yeah, not so. the Bible. Yeah. Miracles happen. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> Pour one out. <laughs> I actually can't believe that we're running out of time because we are going to be going to audience questions really soon. So start cooking those. Um, but I cannot let you leave the stage um, without talking about your next novel. Like, tell us as much as you can, like everything. <laughs> okay, I'm really interested in nonsense right now. Um, okay. And by that, I mean I've worked on so many novels that have a quality of verisimilitude and pretty uh, direct realism in the way they're launching their critique. So. Babel is pretty closely tied to what really was going on in the 1830s, and the magic system is uh, coherent and easily mappable. And the Pop War trilogy is more removed. It's a secondary, like, epic fantasy world, but it's still, like, every change, every metaphor, every fantastical element has, like, a clear symbolic explanation, but... Recently, I've become very interested in texts that don't offer that level of easy analysis for the reader and create just like really troubling surface level experiences. So I'm thinking about okay. like films by like David Lynch or uh, or really even a lot of Miyazaki films that have fantastical world building, and you're like okay, but like, why are there parakeets and why do they have teeth? Um, I highly recommend the new Miyazaki film, The Boy and the Heron. That's what I'm referencing. And it is one of his like most like strange, fantastical worlds that have like the barest minimum of world-building explanation. And I'm fascinated in texts where things can get super weird, but the reader is still compelled to follow the main character throughout because like you know, what is that through line? And in many cases, it's a strong main character. So the best example of what I'm talking about is Alice in Wonderland. Nothing makes sense in Wonderland. Like, everything's topsy-turvy. Like, you can't get a, like, you can't get a hold on the world. It's shifting beneath your feet and disappearing yeah. and reforming, even as you're standing still. But the reason why it's easy to follow that text is because the voice of Alice is so, so distinctive and compelling. So I'm working on a novel where nothing makes sense except for the main character, who is deeply troubled and wants to get out of hell um but the oh, premise so he's is in hell or she oh they he and she it's a girl and boy situation oh. um, uh, what but was the hand movement oh <laughs> 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 face sitting in the rad camp <laughs> uh, 
but it's about uh, two PhD students who study magic, um, who journey to hell to rescue the soul of their advisor who died in a freak magical accident so that he can write them job recommendations. Um, so that <laughs> they can... That sounds, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. But then it becomes like my weird, like nonsense psychoscape, and it's been, you know, this is why it's been really hard to write um, because it is all just like barely hanging together by a thread, and it's actually much harder to like let your imagination go completely loose and follow um, it to the darkest places instead of staying in a like carefully constructed world that is a close parallel to our world but so we're going to see some dark sides of you well not not that we often already have seen quite some dark sides of you oh i mean i've just on. written a scene where the main character on the advice of a mysterious ghostly presence inhales like crushed up chalk like it's cocaine uh, <laughs> okay. to give her magical abilities to fight skeleton men so <laughs> I am so on board for this. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. I cannot wait. Are you, are you finished yet? Can you send it me? No, New Year's <laughs> Eve, so I don't have oh, to yeah. talk to my sister. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. OK. So New Year's Day. <laughs> my inbox. OK. It's your turn. Have we got any questions? I'm assuming you've got loads of questions, because you guys. Yes, over there. Got a roving mic. So the mic will make its way to you. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I think, well, you're talking a little bit about um, darker sides. Um, and um, when I was reading The Poppy War, I was doing it on audiobook, um, like walking down the street. And there were some descriptions that were just so like visceral that I needed to like stop and pause and like yeah. take a deep breath um, because they were just so like violent and aggressive and like impactful in a way that like made me stop. Um, so I was wondering um, kind of how you got to that place and how you came up with like language that profound and violent. <laughs> I think you're probably talking about the chapter in the Poppy War that is a direct parallel to the rape of Nanjing in 1937, early 1938. Um, and when I'm writing about historical atrocity, I'm never doing it to sensationalize violence or come up with the grotesque for the sake of um, an interesting spectacle for the viewer to look at. There are some fantasy writers who really love writing very grisly, grotesque, violent scenes um, because it's fun, but I've never seen the attraction in doing that. So a lot of the turns of phrase that I use or descriptions or even just things that happen come directly from the historical record. And in this case, they came um, largely from Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanjing, which was one of the first English language accounts that told this history to an audience that uh, for the most part was unaware that it had ever happened. And I think, those images just were seared in my mind. They're not things that you can ever forget. Um, but at the same time, that scene is a scene that I've never been able to reread. So I'm pretty uh, particular about revision. Like I revise meticulously and edit every line and every turn of phrase. Like I'll even switch uh, articles that are very close just to get the like perfect effect before the book goes to print. Um, but I did like one pass of that scene for grammar after I wrote it the first time and I just could never bring myself to look at that scene ever again. Yeah, pretty brutal. Um, any more questions? I think there was one here first, second row, sorry. Hello. Um, so our question. <laughs> oh, no, Okay. <laughs> My she just disowned you. <laughs> basically. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so basically, um, I'm a new writer, and I know you've probably had this question so many times in the past, I'm sorry. But um, basically, it's basically... 
what would you recommend to young people like us, I guess, who are kind of trying to, one, break into the industry, but to kind of find, not find our own voice, that sounds so cringy, but, you know, get to a place where we can say, okay, I'm happy with this, I need to find an agent, I need to find a publisher, blah, 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 blah. Also recommend this to HarperCollins, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wish we had any power. <laughs> well... I think the one piece of advice that I think applies to all writers, no matter where you are in your career or what your writing style is like, is that you should read extensively and try to read in translation or read in another language. And I say this because there's only so much that English can offer. And I am always interested in... So the prose that I enjoy reading the most is the prose that pushes the boundaries of what you can do with the sentence. But the authors who are able to do that are coming from other linguistic worlds and uh, literally move through the world differently, right? I'm thinking of Nabokov, who just mid-career decided to start writing in English instead and described it in one of his loosely autobiographical novels as, uh, well, I've never heard of an athlete who was an Olympic medalist in both skiing and basketball, but I'm that equivalent for <laughs> writers. Um, and, and he was. His English is... His English fiction is incredible, um, in part because he's playing with words and putting them in combinations and, and doing things with imagery that no other writers who are native speakers of English are doing. Uh, and well, so the example I always give of why it's true that we move through the world differently in other languages is even basic concepts like time and space are, are not universal, right? Or how they're mapped against each other. You might think our conceptual spatial metaphors for time are pretty intuitive. In English, the future is forward, right? The past is behind us. We're looking ahead, we look back. This is not true in Chinese. In Chinese, it's the opposite. The future is behind us and the past is in front of us because we can see the past. We know what happened in the past, we're facing the past. We can only walk backwards into the future without knowing what we're going to encounter. So if even basic concepts like space and time differ across languages, how many other millions of differences exist in how we sense the world, like what we smell, what we see, all the words for love and taste and, and foods and, and friendship. It's, it's just all so different when you're not in English and then when you try to bring that back into English, it's going to do really fun things with your sentences. So read in other languages if you have them. If you don't, then read in translation. There's one over here. Hi there. Um, following on what you're just talking about with linguistics, one of the many concepts I really enjoyed in Pavel was the how the sp I'm going to call it spell casting, how the the magic was imbued into the silver using two words and subtle differences of meaning or etymology of the words. Did you have those in mind as you wrote the book, or did you have some of them already in in your mind? Or and do you have any that you didn't use because you couldn't think of how to incorporate them? Because I found that really fascinating as an aspect of the of the book. I sat with etymology dictionaries for a long time, just flipping through stuff that could possibly be relevant. And it's the sort of thing where you just can't write a scene and describe the effect that a match pair is going to have and then go find that relevant match pair without any knowledge of the linguistic history of those words. It's more that I would sit with all of these books about etymology and false friends and cognates and um, you know branches and, and words that were once closely related and were no longer were and, and think about those differences and then find a way to tie a scene around them um, just because doing it in the opposite would have been absolutely impossible. Um, as for match pairs that I didn't put in the text, look, if I found one that works, like, it was going in the novel. <laughs> I just, like, would not waste that work. But a match pair that I really love is the one that Robin uses during his third year exam, where he's um, doing a play on the Chinese word Ming to illuminate, to understand. And I like that character a lot because it's the radicals for the sun and the moon and just that imagery of celestial bodies and light and illumination and, and seeing is a really cool cluster of concepts for me.
Thank you. Directly behind you. Fifth row, maybe. What are the different challenges you face when creating fantasy worlds, when starting with a completely blank slate, like in The Poppy War, or adding fantastical elements, like in Babel, or even with your new novel, where there's a lot of accounts of hell from mythology or Dante, where you can pick and choose your own bits you want to take reference from? You go first. No, no, you go. <laughs> I have to think. <laughs> so more about... Sorry, can you... Sorry. Like what are the challenges of world building for you? So, so many things. My own brain, to be honest. Um, I think pinning down, like, time, the concept of time is always really challenging for me because I always want to think, like, how would you tell time if you didn't have a clock? Um, and obviously most people think the moon. But then what if you see the moon as a god? So time for me has always been really challenging. There's lots of little things like that, but um, I often just sit and, and write down, like, you know, for example, time, fauna, flora. I just, I build it like little building blocks and <laughs> whatever I get is the world I have. Yeah, I think about time a lot too and a sense of history and making that history feel real and lived in instead of like convenient backstory to move the plot along. Um, but the challenge I'm thinking about is like knowing the world well enough at all to write about it when it doesn't exist yet. Because I have a, I'm going to use an example that is so obnoxious and then explain why it's not obnoxious. I won't write scenes if it feels like I'm doing conscious construction or if I'm making something up. Like, I don't like feeling like a storyteller. Um, I will only work on a scene if I understand it well enough that it feels like I'm just recounting a memory or explaining what happened in a dream. And um, this is an obnoxious way to say I have to be able to visualize the atmosphere so vividly and see the characters and know how they feel and know what they're smelling and seeing, knowing how the grass feels beneath their feet, uh, knowing the weight attributed to everything in their line of sight, all the symbols, all the, you know, all the history and the auras of the world, right? Mm -hmm. But it's hard to just like have a sense of that right away like very rarely do those worlds just plop wholesale into your head you have to tinker them with a while you have to tinker with them for a while and then live in them in your head for a while before you feel like you've walked through this world by yourself long enough that you could convey it to somebody else and that's why the building block method of world building doesn't super work for me because I need to know from the outset like how does it feel to be a traveler here how does it feel to have grown up in this world so I will do that slow assembly of like what what's the magic system like what creatures do we have what real world aesthetics is this pulled from but it all has to fester long enough that I feel like I see it and I'm from there and I'm just telling you what it was like and this takes forever that's why yellow face is a lot easier to write than catabasis because catabasis is like a nightmare romp through like your most like uncontrolled dream um, and it's hard to spend time in that uh, that sphere of like absolute instability long enough to to feel like you know the atmosphere and now I've been there for a while and um, I'm, I'm glad I'm getting out <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting I'm the exact opposite like I have to I don't know what's going to come next I can't linger because it's it's literally happening as I write um, and I, I feel like oh, the story how special time. for you <laughs> 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 some of us have to think with our brains <laughs> and plan I'm still thinking <laughs> how fortunate you are <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> ah, we've got an online question. Yeah, hello. We have an online question. Um, and Beth asks, do you think The Poppy Wars is YA? And I guess by extension, are you conscious of the audience that you're writing for? I don't think anybody really knows what YA means. <laughs> and um, I don't really care. Like, There used to be a time where I got really persnickety about people calling it YA because it's not written with children in mind. It's written for an adult audience. Um, although I really don't mind if like precocious children read those books. I think YA is just like a mostly 
arbitrary marketing category um, just to tell booksellers like where to put things on shelves. But we have all these normative judgments about like the value of an adult writer versus a YA writer. And are you really reading serious literature if you're reading children's literature? Um, and I've just asked a friend during the fantasy exhibit, oh, should I read The Dark is Rising? I never got in on that joy. And it, it seems like I really should read those. And I would get a, like a lot out of that experience, even though I'm not the intended audience. So I think like all YA really means is where did the author want their books in the store? And I don't want my books in the children's section. So um, that's why I don't think they're YA. But beyond that, I don't really care. As for the question of do I think about the audience when I'm writing, I don't think you can uh, very much without letting it just destroy and corrupt your yeah. joy in the process. If you're thinking too much about how is this going to be received, who's going to read it, who's going to like it, what are they going to say about it, then you're already anticipating a reaction to a work that doesn't even exist yet. So like, at some point, my audience comes into consideration, mostly just because I hope that people will like it. But when I'm writing, um, the most important thing is that this text is interesting to me. This is a place where yeah. I want to spend time. Like These sentences are fun to construct, and these problems are interesting to think about. Because if it's not interesting to me, if it's not like the the work that I have the most passion and excitement for doing in the moment, then it's not going to read as genuinely exciting to anybody else. Yeah, that's fair. Do you think about audience when you write? I try not to, because I think you can get really stuck in a loop of like, oh, I'm doing this for people who like this trope. I'm doing it for people who like this. I'm, I'm aiming for this audience. Um, and you just lo I, I lose the love, what I'm trying to find in the story. So I don't think about my audience as much as I can. And I just try and think, like I did when I wrote The Final Strife, like, this will never be published. Even if I have a contract, which I do, um, I try and not think of the fact that this is for a publishing house. It's like, this will never be published. This is just for me. Um, and then by the end, I'm like, well, this can't be published because it's a hot mess. And then I edit it. And then that's when I start thinking a little bit of the audience. Yeah, you've got to write the thing that even if nobody else in the world read or cared about it, you would still be happy existed yeah. on paper. Yeah, absolutely. We had a few hands. Aha, one right there. I'll move this way next. Hello. Um, Sorry in advance, because I remember from bitter experience that sometimes I hated this question, but could you tell us a little bit about your PhD and how that feeds into kind of your fictional work as well? Well, right now it means that um, I don't get a lot of sleep. And, um, I'm stressed about deadlines all the time. Um, but, well, so this year is particularly stressful because I'm in my third year and at my university, that's usually when graduate students take their qualifying exams. And qualifying exams are this horrendous process where you basically, it's the last phase before you're free to just write your dissertation, where you have to prove your mastery over the subfields that you would be qualified to teach. And my subfields are modern Sinophone literature, Asian American history, and Asian American literature. And what this means logistically is that I had to put together lists of um, between 50 and 70 70 texts uh, split across time periods for each three of the subfields, which means in total between 150 and like 180 um, like book length texts that I have to read and understand and be able to explain in a two hour oral exam that will take place on April 29th. So I'm not <laughs> thinking about that too much at all. Um, and this just dominates my every waking moment, but it's really fun to be at the stage um, with my fields where I'm no longer just like taking individual seminars and learning cool stuff in the seminars, but have this bird's eye perspective of all the work that's been done and how everybody's in conversation with one another. And I always really like adored how professors I loved, like if you ask them a question, like tell us about the production of middle brow um, literature during the Cold War and how it, it brought Asia closer to home, which is the topic of one of my Cold War texts, um, that they would just not only be able to like give you multiple like scholars, uh, recommendations of scholars who had worked on that, but also like the historiography of how this conversation had shifted over the decades, you know, what's the difference between 
between how we understood Asian American literature and identity in the 70s versus today. And, and I feel like I'm getting to that point, which is really cool um, because I love teaching and I love my field. But uh, right now, it just means that I'm, I'm writing a fantasy novel about how academia is hell. <laughs> A question over here. Yep, second row. Um, I guess my question's kind of similar, but not really about the PhD. Sorry. Um, when writing Babel, I guess what kind of had me in awe was just the amount of knowledge that went into it. Like the, just like, what was the process like for researching through so many languages and regions? Like. How did you not get so overwhelmed that you kind of just didn't write Babel? Because you wrote Babel, and I have it in my bag, so if that makes sense. <laughs> it does exist, yes. <laughs> I'll just comment on one aspect of the research process, because if I talked about all the texts I read, we'd be here for hours. Um, but people do ask about the language thing, because I don't even speak that many languages, and I don't That have many. The... How many do you <laughs> speak at the moment? Uh, just a few. But... Um... <laughs> It my, always increases every time we meet. Yeah. I can read French better than I can speak French, but um, the, the trick with Babel is that I didn't have to learn to speak all those languages. I just had to have a lot of friends um, who either spoke those languages or who had parents who spoke those languages. And um, this was a really wonderful part of the process because so much of how we perceive fantasy writing and writing in general is this solitary act, you know, it's all within a singular mind and it's this like one soul um, creating the whole world, but Babel is necessarily collaborative and like it's baked into the themes of the novel as well, like people are bringing their expertise from all sorts of different backgrounds in all different places in the world, so it made sense that I would reach out to my very international group of friends and ask them, not just like what's the translation of this, what's the translation of this, but I would ask them questions like, tell me about a phrase that you don't think translates well into English, or tell me about a phrase that you would use in these sorts of emotionally resonant um, or very emotionally fraught moments. And I feel like that brought us closer together and it was fun talking with my friends about how they move through the world. But the end result of Babel, I think, is this really collaborative um, bringing together of many different voices and many different backgrounds. And uh, it's, it's not my work alone. And I, I was really excited about getting to do that with a book because I've never done something so collaborative before. It's lovely. It's a question. Somewhere here. Yes. I'll see you. Hi there. So a question for both of you, but specifically for you, Rebecca. I think you've published five books in about the last five years um, while being a, a student at the time. So presumably an awful lot of work. For the both of you, what does your writing process look like? Are you sitting down every day for four or five hours at a computer, typing away, and then that's it? Or is this some days you write nothing, and then all of a sudden you lock yourself away for 24 hours and out comes 10 chapters? What does that look like for the two of you? You're doing two trilogies in yeah. three years, so. And a duology, because I can talk about Cleopatra now. Um, yeah, I think I'm on like, it'll be eight books in five years or four years or something. Four years, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't sleep. No, I do. Um, I think for me, I work in really big bursts. I, if I have, if I'm on draft, if I'm drafting a novel, I, I, I'm sorry to everyone who writes books. Don't do what I do. But I, I probably complete a novel in like four weeks. Um, that's working every single day. Uh, it's really tough. And then when I get to the end, I'm like, that is a mess. And then I spe spend like another four weeks editing. And by that point, I'm like, maybe I'll show my agent. And then my agent will give me edits. And I'll do another two, three weeks of edits. And then it'll get to my editor. So I'm on like a two-month, three-month turnaround for a novel. Um, and I was, I was actually a student. I just finished a master's degree. And that was a really, just because for fun, why not? Um, <laughs> and that was really tough. Um, but I made my dissertation about my book seven, which is now announced, Cleopatra. So that was great, because then I was like working on both things. Yeah, I envy your productivity. Because um, now I've slowed down a bit, and I think slowing down is good. I 
originally was supposed to have Catabasas ready to put out next year, but I'm getting married next year and I want to go on my honeymoon and enjoy my life for a little bit. And also my exam is on April 29th. Yes. So <laughs> focusing on that first. Um, but I've actually had to think really hard and make some adjustments with my own work schedule over the past few years because it was starting to feel unsustainable. I think writing the popular trilogy was a bit easier because all undergraduate work is just easier compared to grad school um, commitments. Uh, but I, I mean, this novel took so long to finish in part because the PhD is just really, really hard. And then at the same time, I was touring for Babel and Yellowface and had all these extra commitments and was traveling all the time. Um, and there's a moment over the summer where I felt like my attention was so split between the dozen things I had to do every day that I couldn't get into the zone to, to create anymore. And this made me like go back to the drawing board and think about, oh, how am I going to structure my day? And I ended up reading these two really obnoxious books um, by Cal Newport, who just has a very obnoxious tone. Um, and likes to remind people in every other sentence that he went to MIT. Uh, but they're called Deep Work and Digital Minimalism. And they don't work for everybody because the, the argument is basically try harder and focus more. And it's like, oh, great. <laughs> like, how, how useful. But um, he does have these, like, he's just such an extremist about how he organizes his time. So the thing I took away from it is I just do not answer emails or take phone calls or look at or even turn on the internet before noon. Uh, I'm really, I'm the most productive in the morning, so now I'm very, very protective of that writing time. Um, and I just like clear off everything on the table, like nobody can access me. Uh, before, well, it's tough for my UK team who are five hours ahead and need to schedule meetings before noon sometimes, but, um, you know, sacrifices must be made for the sake of art. Uh, and, like, just being really Spartan and extreme about, like, what are my productivity hours and how am I not going to let anything else get in the way of that has helped me return to like the pace of writing that I felt like I was at before life got really crazy with Babel and Yellowface and it's been the most important adjustment I've made to to my life. Um, I also have this hourglass. Um, I brought it on a writing retreat with Sara. Don't so. do that. We did write. <laughs> yeah. Well, so like, the, and the rule is nobody can speak to me while the hourglass yeah. is. It, it counts for half an hour. So my fiance will come out like wanting a hug, and I'll point to the hourglass. He he hates the hourglass. <laughs> um, but I think like. You know, you can get so much done in 30 minutes, and especially when the sand's almost out, you like, I find you always kind of push yourself in the last five, 10 minutes to get more done before the session's over. So yeah, between being really extreme about mornings and having an hourglass, those are the productivity hacks that have made my life a little easier. Yeah, get yourself an hourglass, they're pretty good. And they're just ah, really cool looking. Should we have another online question? Um, Samantha asks, how you balance staying faithful to mythology, folklore, and history while also integrating modern ideals and diversity? I'm not faithful to anything. I was about to say, <laughs> like, no way. <laughs> um, well, the, I just, like, deny the premise of that question, that there is a conflict between modern ideals like diversity, yeah. mythology, and history, because as we've just discussed, like Victorian England was so much more colorful and multilingual and heterogeneous than um, a lot of the Victorian era films would have us believe. So when my work is the most like inclusive in modern parlance, it's, it's when it's being the most faithful to history. So that's just not even a contradiction in my head. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, th I kind of consider it more of a truth. I actually think that the historical truth that we create and the things that we are reimagining has more truth to it in so many ways because you know all history is fiction. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like diversity is not the fantasy. White Victorian London is the yes. fantasy. Yes, yes. Probably last question. Oh, I can't choose. Over there. Oh, oh someone else chose. Great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, it's kind of a quick one, but I was just wondering, um, kind of, 
well, what are you guys reading at the moment? And whether does this always tie in what with um, like what you're writing at the same time? So whether you're reading for pleasure is completely different or whether it sort of, yeah, ties in more closely with what you're writing. Yeah. <laughs> I am reading um, a sequel, actually, just for fun, um, called Sunbringer by Hannah Kana, which is out next year. Um, it's wonderful and you're all in for a treat. Um, I'm trying to just like go through my TBR at the moment and not read academically because having just finished my masters, it was just really nice to just go. Um, and I'm doing big research trips next year, so it's just nice to read for fun again. Um, I so there's two things that um, are on my bedside table, and the first is Italo Calvino's um, Six Memos for the Next Millennium, I think is the title, but in any case, it's the collection of his Norton lectures that he delivered at Harvard in the 1980s, and there's an uh, the second essay on lightness, I think, is incredible, and I keep coming back to it, thinking about lightness and being nimble and flexible and how we think about history and representation instead of um, the opaqueness of uh, the burden of representation, I think, has yeah, been really eye-opening for me. Then the, uh, the fiction that I'm working through are all the short stories that Borges ever wrote. Um, because if, you, if you're thinking about nonsense literature and... Uh, conceits that only sustain themselves as long as you don't blink or look away, then you know every three, four page Borges story is the perfect example of that. And it's been good in teaching me not to take myself so seriously or need the world to hang together longer than it needs to. I just have to have a cool idea, uh, like what if the gods were dead, and then run with that um, for a few paragraphs until the world reforms to the next cool idea. Okay, we've got like skeleton men, dead gods. And cocaine sure. chalk. <laughs> the cocaine chalk is the like my favorite. Because <laughs> like tell me you've never thought about it. Like writing on a chalkboard and then like erasing the blackboard and then like the powders in the air and you're like <gasps> <laughs> I well, think about this every week after I'm done teaching. I'm like erasing the just inhaling the, chalk. Yeah, and like it's all over my hands and just all of my clothes, snow. and I'm like, I look, I look so cool right now. <laughs> this could be cocaine. <laughs> and that's where we're gonna stop. <laughs>